Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we will be reviewing the Sim Magic M10 wheelbase and GT1 wheel kit with some innovative functionality and an overall professional look and feel to it. It looks to be an attractive entry-level direct drive force feedback solution. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Now for our closer look segment on the SimMagic M10 wheelbase. We'll go over some specs first. It is a 10 newton meter peak wheelbase. I think that's peak because they don't designate peak or nominal on their website. It just says 10 newton meters. And usually a manufacturer will use the peak figures on their ratings for their newton meters or how much torque their wheelbase is going to put out. This is heavy. It has a stepper motor in it. Only the second solution that I've had in the SRG with a stepper motor in it. And the other one was the AccuForce, the original AccuForce and the AccuForce V2, which as far as I could tell from looking at it, had the same stepper motor in it. Right. So stepper motor, 10 newton meter, and really that's about it as far as the performance goes. And we'll talk more about that, obviously, as we progress through the review. Now, this is a heavy setup. It is 19 pounds and 12 ounces, or around nine kilos for the rest of the world. And you definitely can feel it when you pick it up. The casing that you see here, it has a Sim Magic. It looks like this is kind of a silk screened print on here. And we have a carbon fiber. I believe that's a fake carbon fiber front on it. You can see it there. And we have a Sim Magic logo there. And that's actually a power indication light, too, that we'll see about that later. And while we have it up here, the front here, you can see the hub that we're going to be using this GT1 wheel, which is also part of the review, but we'll get to that later. And you can see on the front here, we have some contact pads for the pins that are in that wheel. So when we attach the quick release, the electronics pass through can happen, right? When you turn this motor, you can feel the steps. You can feel notchiness. It's very evident, but that doesn't mean it's going to feel like that, obviously, when we're running it, but that's what you feel here. Now, this is again, an extruded aluminum enclosure, and you can see the grooves here on the side. And then on the bottom, you can see some, ho obviously some holes and some bolts that are holding this assembly together. And we're going to be using this bottom piece here to actually mount our brackets, but we'll talk about that when, when we get to the mounting segment. And we'll go around to the back where the power cord is. And again, we have that I, I believe that's, we'll, we'll find out when we take it out, but I don't believe that's real carbon fiber. It looks too thin to me. But we've got a cooling fan in there. We've got some CAN bus interfaces, and we have a reset button in here. A little reset light button in there. And, of course, USB-B for attaching it to our PC. Well, there's not much else going on. I like the cable gable on here. I always like these metal cable gables that you can put a wrench on and tighten up or loosen up to get things apart. And I will be probably taking that off so that I can take this apart and we do our look inside segment. What else do I want to talk about here? <laughs> not much else. I mean, there's not a whole lot to see. We'll talk about some dimensions. The case itself comes in at 200 and looks like 13 millimeters, just the case. If I go out here and bump up against the case and look at this shaft all the way out to the end here, that comes out to about 113 millimeters. And width-wise, go around the back here, and that's from this edge of this extruded shell to the other edge, and that's coming in at 155 millimeters. Last but not least, we'll do the height, and that's with it sitting flat on a flat surface, not mounted, obviously, and that looks to be about 123 millimeters tall. So those are the dimensions. Now, what do we get with this wheel? You get a power supply, obviously, because we have to plug it into our cable back here we just saw. Now, this is a universal type of power supply. It will, I don't know how well you guys are going to see this, but it goes 110 to 200 volts at 4 amps. That's the input. And we have, what is it, 24 volts at 9.2. So I'm going to put this up here and see if you guys can actually freeze frame that. And take a look at it. So yeah, 24 volts, 9.2 amps, and 10 newton meters. That sounds about right. 221 watt max. And we have a little indication light on here. I believe that's blue when you plug it in. And we have, it's, it looks like a laptop <laughs> power supply to me because they've got this adapter on the front here. The typical, I believe that's 3.5 mil adapter. 
or maybe that's 5.5. Anyway, let me pull that apart and show you what I mean. See this little plug here? That's what I have on some of my laptops for the power supply that you connect to your laptop. So anyway, and this is the adapter that they're using on it. What is that? I think that's five. Let me, now I'm curious what they're using here as far as, let's see. Yeah, five and a half. That's a five and a half, probably a one and a half internal. Two and a half internal. Right. So it looks like to be just an adapter to me that they're putting on here. Right. We'll put that back on. So that's our power supply. Now you get two cables with this. No, 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 I'm sorry, you don't get two cables. I, mean, I, said, I put two cables on here because I want to show you the differences. This cable that comes with it is the 220 volt cable. And it has an integrated, much like the AccuForce, switch in it. So that's how you turn it on and off. Now, it has a regular plug on the other side, obviously, because this can go either way on the power supply itself. So you could just go ahead and use a regular, if you're in North America and you need the 110, 115 volt, you could just take a, one of your spare computer cords laying around and use that if you want, but you won't get the function of the power switch. You'll just have to plug it in and out if you want to do it that way. But you know, the, with the, this power switch being on the cord itself anyway, which I never did like that solution on the AccuForce and I not particularly care for it here either. I'd rather have a switch somewhere else. But anyway, maybe on the case here somewhere. But yeah, you're really not losing it much because you're still going to have to chase your cord down to hit your switch. So I don't know. Up to you. We also get an adapter so that we can use the switch. And this is an, let me get this out of the way, a typical adapter you'll see for taking European current or 220 volts into a 115, 110 volt. And that'll work. So you just plug it in, obviously, at the end of here, and you're done. So again, it's up to you what you want to do as far as that's concerned. We do get some brackets. And again, I'll talk more about the mounting when we get to that segment. And it's a peculiar looking bracket, and it's got two holes here. And the reason I say it's got two holes here that we're going to not be using, we're going to be using these top holes. So I'm not sure what they were doing here. But anyway, it is a nice looking bracket. The finish is very good, which, by the way, if you didn't, couldn't tell by looking at this, looks pretty good all around on this unit. They do a good job with their presentation, no doubt. And this has a nice, looks like powder coat finish on it for the brackets. And of course, we're going to get two, one on each side that we we'll are mounting probably like this, somewhere like that. But we'll, again, we'll talk more about that when we get to the mounting. What else we get? We get some hardware to do that mounting. And that's nice. They give us some... What are these? Little T-nuts. They're not spring T-nuts or anything like that, but they are black, so everything's black. But we also have these square nuts. So depending on how you want to mount it, I believe both of those will work. You get a little Allen wrench. But again, once we're mounting, we'll look at that more. Now, I got a bag with two cords in it. I'm not sure why I got two cords. Maybe for the CAN bus? But I, I, don't, I don't think so, because the CAN bus has an A interface, and these are two B interfaces. But they do have a ferrite core in the line, which is kind of nice, and it's kind of a translucent brownish color to it with our nice pink <laughs> A plug on it. So yeah, I don't know why they put two in here. Probably just didn't mean to do that, but there it is. And we have a warranty card, I'm guessing. It says repair card, so I imagine that's what translates from in Chinese to English when they're reading it and trying to translate it. But you can see it says repair card, right? And it's a typical thing we open up for a warranty replacement, filling in the information and so forth. So if anything goes wrong, don't lose your warranty card. <laughs> All right, anything else we want to talk about on a closer look? I think that's it. Uh, we'll come, we'll get to the wheel closer look segment and talk about how that works and far as it interfaces with it, which will probably be a longer segment because I have to put it on here and I want to go through some of the settings you can do with the wheel, but maybe I'll break that in two settings, but we'll see once we get there. Now let's take a closer look at the GT1 wheel. And this is the round one. They actually have one that you can get that is a D model, which is flat in the bottom, which I typically kind of prefer those wheels, but this is the one they sent me, so this is the one I'm reviewing. And right out of the box, it feels like a great wheel. It has a nice grip on it. It's leather. You can smell the leather on it. It's pretty good as far as the texture on here. Give you guys a closer look at it. And the stitching, you can see the gold stitching in there. All the stitching looks very good. I did take a look at it before I started filming this. 
just to make sure there weren't any defects in it that I could point out to you, because I like pointing stuff like that out, but yeah, it's a, it's a well done job here. I have no problem with it. It is 300, it's almost 330 actually. Let's see what I have here. I'm looking at 328 as far as the diameter. So it is a big wheel, all right? It has a nice plate on the front. We have some silk screening going on, just like we have over here on the wheelbase that is their, their logo apparently. It's a three screw piece here and I'm, I'm assuming these, these bolts go all the way through to the quick release on the back. The wheel itself, I'm not sure if that's aluminum or steel. I think that's aluminum and it looks to be about four mil thick. Let's see what we got here. I hope if I turn that on first. Yeah, four mils. So I would assume that's aluminum. And because, you know, the weight, a lot of the weight's right here, though. These quick releases are heavy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right, the front has this, again, the carbon fiber theme going on here. This does not look like real carbon fiber to me because I'm looking down the, the, the seam here, what it looks like the seam to me on this button plate in the back. And it doesn't look like it's uh, real carbon fiber, but we'll take a closer look at it later on. I'll give you a shot of it under the lights. Now we have good button position. I think right here where your thumb goes, easy to reach that. And we have a momentary switch right there, a little toggle. We have another button down here. We have an encoder. And the encoder actually feels good. The notches feel pretty good on this. And it's also a push button. So we have three moves on each one of these encoders. And this one feels just as good as that one. Not a lot of play in the shafts. So, and it feels like these are like little aluminum pieces here. Doesn't feel plastic. And I can see that we have some set screws down in there. I don't know how you guys are going to see that, but there's a set screw right down in there in that little groove so you can take off the knobs. And we have, again, some momentary switches or buttons over here. They have, they're actually lit up. They're red buttons, right? So, and, which, and it actually changed the pattern on that too. But we'll get to the functionality of this wheel probably another segment because it's going to be probably a long one. We can actually change the uh, the the wheel over here as far as the degrees of the turn, right? So we can go 900 degrees from turn to turn, 1080. We also have a 540 down here and a 360 over here. And you can actually do this on the fly, according to what they're saying, by using this little mode switch here. This red switch here, and you notice it's the only one with red on it, is a mode switch. And it doesn't really do anything as far as setting an assignment in game. It just sets modes for changing the you're supposed to be able to change your force feedback your dampening in here I believe and yeah it's just you're supposed to be doing, you're able to do a lot with this and clutches setting and calibrating your clutches of course this wheel does not have clutches it only has the paddles so we won't be covering that anything else on the front I want to talk about no it's just a good looking wheel I don't know how well you guys are seeing this under the lights here but yeah it's just a good looking and feeling wheel right out of the box and we do have some I'm going to show you this little finger grips on the back even. It's just a good feeling leather. This is the kind of wheel that I would not want to wear a glove with because the, the leather feels so good. And we have the grips over here too. We even have grips back here <laughs> on the top. So if you're one of those low rider cruisers, you can put one hand up there and one hand on the shifter or whatever and just cruise like that. <laughs> All right. Now continue on to the back. We can see we have some... I've never seen this before on, on a button plate and that is... Some vents for cooling and all that. So yeah, I suppose we can use that. Now we also have some more holes here, which I'm assuming you might be able to mount the analog paddles onto this button plate. But I'm not. I can't be sure. They might be using the same button plate on another wheel. We can do that. I don't know, but that's what I would think those holes would be for. And they're not. I don't see any threads in the holes though. But yeah, that's what I would think. And of course we have a USB mini in here, not micro, but a mini. And that's so that you can use this wheel on any wheelbase you want, as long as it has that quick release. Or you could just take the quick release off and use whatever quick release you want to, or just bolt it directly on the, from the front over here. So let's talk about the shifters. Now the shifters are nice. They've got proper three millimeter thick carbon paddles on there, and these are real carbon paddles. I was checking them out. You can always know if it's if it's carbon. You can look usually look along the edge of it. 
and see some very thin lines, which are the layers of the layup of this particular piece of carbon fiber. Carbon fiber looks good. I don't see any defects anywhere. As far as in the weave, it all looks good. And sometimes you can see that, you know, you can see little defects in the weave when you're looking at these things, but these all look good. They do have the plus and the minus cut out on them, which I prefer not to have. I still don't know why we need to have that. If, if you don't know which is your upshift and downshift, you know, you've got other problems, I think, if you're a race car driver. <laughs> it's always on the right. Of course, if you want to, I suppose you could reverse it, you know, if you wanted to go up with your, your left paddle, but I've never seen anybody doing that. But anyway, this is supposed to be an adjustable magnetic shifter. Now, it is magnetic. You can hear it, which I do like. It feels good. It's, it's not real heavy to pull. Not as much tension as I personally prefer, but it gets the job done, and it's a nice tactile feel when you hit that. Yeah, I like that. It, it's very nice. I, I like the way they did this. These are aluminum housings on these shifters, so very nicely done there. And they give you some color-coded red screw washers that have flathead screws in them. You can see that we have some white nylon type of a bushing here. And we'll, we'll look closer at this stuff probably when we do the look inside. And now to the only thing left, the quick release. And you can see inside the quick release we have these little pins in here, little gold pins. And of course those will interface with, if you saw the closer look part of the M10 wheelbase right in there. So they will make contact with that. And they should, push down, yeah, these pins will actually, they're spring loaded and you can push down on them. Now, as far as the durability of something like this, I think it's going it, to it's gonna be okay, but, I mean, once you lock this quick release onto the piece over here, this other quick release piece, it's not going to move anywhere, so it'll just be riding on there. It's not like it's going to be scraping on anything. And I believe there's probably a cable inside of here that is different. If you guys remember what AccuForce had on it, it had some kind of a wiper circuit board with wipers on it that actually had traces, circle traces on it that the little pieces here would follow, right? But yeah, that, that, was, that ended up not to be a, a very good solution because they, they had a lot of uh, failure rate on those. And they ended, ended up actually replacing them and just taking them out, which was a good idea, I think. Anyway, that should not happen here because I believe there's a cable. I could be wrong. I'm going to have to, once we do the look inside, we'll see how that works. Now, the actual quick release here is the what I call an NRG quick release. It's a typical one where we have the four ball bearings on the bottom and we have six ball bearings on the top. And this is currently set up to be an automatic type of quick release. And what I mean by that, I'm going to set this down, is when you push this down on the wheel, it's going to pop, right? And there's a little ring in here. See that metal ring that's sitting where the bearings are? I'm going to kind of push down on this to take the spring pressure off the ring here. This is where the spring is and push down and then push down on that ring with my finger to get it to come up. Right. And be careful when you do this because it can snap at you. There, there we go. So when I did that, you can see the ball bearings are now out and they should be locked into their corresponding indentations on the other side of quick release or the wheelbase quick release side. Now, the reason I did that, there's a button here, but it's recessed right now and it's in automatic mode. And if you want this to come out, which means I would have to, to get this wheel back off, I would have to press down on that and then pull back on this. It's, it's a safety lock, if you will. And that's typically why by default, they're not sticking out. Now, once I have it out and, and we're doing the look inside, I'll take this quick release off. I'll show you more about that. But I would prefer just to leave it like this because yeah, when you pull it, the quick release, and you don't have to press the button and pull the quick release at the same time. You just pull it back like this and you'll watch that ring pop back up and cover those bearings like that. There you go. And yeah, so I would probably leave it like that, but I'll probably show it to you anyway because that's what we usually do here at the SRG. Now, anything else I want to show you on this steering wheel? Not really. It's, I think you guys can see this. It's a well done wheel out of the box. It has great presentation. Sim Magic has done a very good job on this wheel. It's got good good weight to it, like I said before, two kilos, and yeah, it just feels right. It is a little light on the shifter for me, but again, that's totally subjective. Some people wouldn't care either way, but it's, it's all, I think, at the end of the day, what you get used to when you're driving every day on your rig. Right, so there's the closer look at the steering wheel, and I'll probably go over to the next segment and go ahead and bench mount this 
with, or the wheel on it, and we'll talk about these functions that we get on the wheel. Now we're going to go over some of the settings that this wheel is capable of doing, and the main thing we want to focus here is on this mode switch. Remember, this switch doesn't do anything as far as mapping anything to a game. It has a down position, a center position, and an up position. First, we'll go over the lights. And I think you guys can see the lights, even though I have some light on this, some studio light on it. And what we're going to do to adjust those lights is take this rocker switch, and, or three position switch, whatever you want to call it, and put it all the way in the top, not the middle, but the top position. And that turns this momentary switch into a programmer, basically. So right now I have the lights on and steady on. They're not doing anything. If I push this up, and this just kind of cycles through, so I'm going to push this up one time, and you'll see the lights on the wheel start pulsing. Now, if I hit it again, it's going to continue pulsing, but you can see how fast it is now. It's going to be a lot slower if I hit it one more time. So you can see the cycles now are much slower than they were before. Or if I hit it one more time, it will turn everything off. So if you don't want any lights on your buttons, that was exactly what you would do. And I'm going to leave my buttons on, so I'm going to just begin the cycle again and turn the lights on. Right? Now I'm going to demonstrate the degrees of rotation that can be programmed from the wheel itself. I still have my mode switch at the upper position, so I can program this. And each one of these designations, we have a 360 up here printed on the fake carbon fiber front. We have 900 over here, we have 540 down here, and we have 1080 there. So right now, I'm going to show you on the race manager program where the wheel is as far as rotation. I'm going to go ahead and turn it all the way around, and you can see it is at 180 right now, which would mean we are at 360. So I'm going to press the E button, and that should give me 540, which should be, I believe, 270 one way. So we'll go ahead and turn it one way again. And there we have 270. And if I wanted to leave it there, I would just flip the mode button back down to the bottom, and then it's locked in. The next thing I'm going to demonstrate is that we can change the force feedback amount and the dampening on the wheelbase, on the motor, by using these encoders or rotaries down here on the bottom. And I use, obviously, the race manager app again to show you this and again I have my mode switch from down all the way down to the top position and now I'll turn one of these rotaries here and we'll see what we get and it's not going to be easy for you guys to see this okay that moved there so you can see on the top mechanical setting at total force it's actually moving now it doesn't move smoothly it jumps around a bit when I do this and I think it's because of the encoder jumps around a bit and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute but yeah, I can get this to 100, but if I do it one notch, it jumps down to 70. And again, this is such a small app here. I don't know how well you're going to see this on my screen, but I'm, you know, I'm trying to show you what it, what it looks like. I can't make it any bigger, so it is what it is. And so anyway, it jumps down to 70 with one click, and then it jumped down to 50 with a second click, and then 20. So it's real, you know, you don't know how far down it's going to go when you click it. So this is really not that effective if you ask me. Uh, it needs to be tuned better, and as I'm turning it up, it's slowly going back up. It was 80, 90, now I'm back up to 100. Now, if I turn the other button, or encoder, on the very bottom, you'll see wheel damper underneath the total force, wheel speed, wheel damper, and that actually can add dampening or take damping away. So it actually works, but it's not very tunable. It jumps around too much, if you ask me. And while this, you know, it's down to 40 right there, and then I just did one hit, and it went all the way up to 100. So I would not say that this is working as it should. <laughs> and, but, you know, it is a feature. Maybe it'll get that sorted out where it's more accurate when you need to use it in-game. But we'll have to wait and see how it works in-game, too, because I'll be looking at the race manager the same time that I'm doing it while we're doing some tuning sessions and see how it works there. But right now, it's not working that great. It does work, but I would not want to use this to change my force feedback, I think, as far as torque goes, because it just... It's not consistent enough. Yeah, it just uh, it jumps around too much. Anyway, so that's how the total force and wheel damping functions work. Now we're back in Race Manager, and we're just going to look at some of the buttons. And as we push them, and you can see that they will light up. Well, 
I've still got it in the upper mode button. So for normal function, you have to, in fact, you know what I just did? I changed it to 360 there. So I'm going to go back over here, push P for 900 degrees because then I want, and then I'm going to shut it down. Now the buttons should work. And there they are. So we got buttons that work. All four of these buttons work without any problems, as you might imagine. My Now that I'm in the regular all the way down position on this rocker switch, my rocker over here momentary will work no problems. You can see them working there with the red indication lights. The shifters are working. Everything seems to be good. And I'm going to go over here to the encoders of the rotaries now, and I'm going to turn those. And this is where I ran into some problems here looking at this. You can see it. If I move it quickly, you can see these the 13 and the 14 lighting back and forth. But if I just move it one at a time, there 13 blinked that time. But I'm actually missing... And I think this might have something to do with that force feedback and damping that we were doing. It was jumping around because this is not getting every click registered. And if we go back the other way, it does the same thing, 14. So if, as I'm turning it, yeah, it just blinks every once in a while there. Little, looks like it's a little better on 14 than on 13. But if you do it quick, well, yeah, it doesn't matter how what the speed is. I think 14 is working better than 13, no doubt. I'll go over here to this encoder, and it's, there it is, it's underneath, that's 15 and 16, and it's doing the same thing. See, I'm going towards 15 there, and it's not working, but 16 seems to work better. So I don't know if that's a driver issue. I'm going to close Race Manager down or reduce it, and then we're going to look at the regular Windows driver application and see what happens there when I turn it, and that's going to be, yeah. There's, it lights about the same. I think it's doing about the same. I'm going the other way. Actually, it looks to be better in the Windows driver. So this might be some kind of an application overlay issue, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. But it needs to be addressed because this, if this does this in game, it's just you know you might as well not even have it mapped out. But it does seem to be working better in the Windows driver. If you can see when I'm turning it there, it picks it up better there than it does in their application. But final. Verdict will be once we're in game or in we're tuning it or trying to map this to something then we'll know for sure now the pushes on these encoders they work fine So the pushing is fine. It's just the sweeping of the Rotaries here or encoders where you want to call them doesn't work very effectively On the bench test, but again once we're in a live session We'll be able to tell better how this all works and we'll obviously be talking about race manager more as far as tuning and it seems to be a pretty simple interface so We'll check that out when we get there and see what it looks like. It's time to get our mounts on so that we can mount this wheelbase to our rig. And again, if you saw in the closer look, you know that we've got these brackets that came in. These are, I believe, three mil. Let's see what they got on the thickness on these things. They are steel. Yeah, they're three mil thick. And this is the part that will mount to whatever you're mounting it to. In this case, I'll be mounting it to my P1X deck mount. That's what the P1X or the guys at SimLab call the P1X deck mount. You know, it's 10 millimeter stick. It's a pretty stout mount. I got to figure out if we're going to have to drill some holes for this, but we won't know until we get the mounts on the side. And you'll see the series of holes in here. Now these two holes on the bottom here is what I was thinking I was going to use at first. But if I use that and I line this up, you guys can see this sideways here better. That's how it would be sitting. So you can see I have a protrusion here on the case. This extruded aluminum casing they're using is coming out. So it would not work that way. So we're going to have to use some of the holes up here. Now that's okay. You know, and then it's going to be sticking out a bit when we do that. If I use these two holes here, this one and this one, which are the next lowest holes, that would line up like this. And you can see that it's sticking out a bit there. So there will be some clearance under this mount on the lowest setting. And once you have the rear one in, this hole here, you can use these front holes to adjust that height as far as your pitch or pivot, whatever. So if you want to raise the pivot up, you would go to the next hole like that, then go to the next hole like that. Pretty easy. I'm probably going to be mounting my flat. That's usually how I mount them because I have a lot of 
maneuverability in the bracket that I'm using here to get the angle exactly where I want it. Now, let's talk about the bolts themselves. You get a series of bolts here. They're all M6 bolts and they're all button heads. We have a 10 mil, this is the short one, and this is what we'll be using because we'll be using these channels here, obviously, to mount our brackets. But we also get a 16 millimeter long button head, same thing, but just longer, and a 25 millimeter. Only two of these, though. I was wondering why they only gave me two of those, because typically you'll want two bolts on each one of these brackets, mounting it to whatever you're going to mount it to. So, yeah, I would have liked to have seen two more of those as far as the depth goes, because 25 millimeters would probably be good for this. This is a 10 mil thick, as we said before, and that would stick up that much and, and give me some more room, plus the bracket thickness, of course, another 3 mil. But this one will fit through here, but it, you can see it's, I don't know how far, well, you can see it from there, but it doesn't have a lot of room on the bottom for the thread to stick out. Just barely sticks out on that bottom there. So I might, I won't be able to get away with that because it was still 3 mils from the bracket width. So I'm going to have to use these. But fortunately, here at the SRG, I have a lot of different bolts, so I'll be able to source that and not have a problem. Now, the nuts they give you, there's two different nuts. There's the silver nuts, these square bits, and we have a regular T-nut type. And I do like these T-nuts because they have the channels in them. You see the profile there. So instead of just smooth across the top here, we have a channel or a tab, if you will, or a raised area on this T-nut. So that means that it will lock into, let's get this guy out of the way, the channel when we put it in here. So when I pull it up into the channel and tighten it down, this part, this smaller part here, the raised area, will fit right into this to keep it from rotating, which I do like. These, I'm guessing they gave us these because we needed something to mount to the bottom of our bracket here to whatever mounting service we're mounting it to, and those are the nuts they gave us. Because these nuts will not fit into these channels here in this extruded aluminum case they use. So it has to be for something else, right? So anyway, so what we're going to do is I'm going to use these 10 mil bolts here and, of course, the T-nuts, and that will slide in there like that. And then that gives me enough room, 3 mil, to go ahead and tighten the bracket down. So I'm going to go ahead and do one. Leave this aside for a moment for this. So we'll go ahead and put the bolt through the bracket first. And then I'll just spin my T-nut on. Just like we were building anything else with aluminum profile. Now these have been, these have got some kind of a coating on them. And typically that can be a little problematic <laughs> when you first try to get these started. But there it goes. If they haven't taken that off, and it can interfere with getting your threads cleared in the actual threaded part of your T-nut. These are going okay. All right, so just like if I was building a piece of profile, I would put that in, except I've gone and put it in the wrong holes. <laughs> so I'm going to go back up the top. See, I want to put them in the, these holes here because they're lower. It's just an instinctive thing that I go for. <laughs> so anyway, we'll just go ahead and put these in these holes. And then... I'm going to have it flat, like I said. Again, if you wanted some kind of an angle, we could change these holes. As you can see, going up would increase the angle of the motor going up. So that would be an up angle, if that's what you want. Right. Now, again, this should be simply sliding this in. If this all fits well and I haven't put the screws in too tight, it looks like heck I have. This is going to be tight. This is going to be close. I'm sure it'll fit, though. There we go. And then the other one, I'm probably going to have to screw that one out a little bit, too. Let's see. There we go. All right. Then we'll go ahead and tighten this down. And these are 4 mil hex heads on these button heads. I'm going to snug that up a little bit. Because I don't know where I'm going to end up putting this as far as where this channel is, as far as back here, front words. Typically, I like to mount it towards the front because that's where all the leverage is when you're using the wheel. So I'm just going to snug that so it doesn't go anywhere. And you can see how much is, is this is going to be sitting above the deck that I mount it to. Which, you know, I, I'm not crazy about. I would like to have this sitting flat on this deck and bolted to it. And if they would put these two holes right here a little bit higher, they would have achieved that. So I'm not sure why they did this. 
you know, I'm, I'm not crazy about it, to be quite honest. I don't like just two six millimeter bolts holding this thing up in the air like it's going to be on my on my deck. And, you know, it is what it is. I could go ahead and change this and put it on the top hole, which would give me a, some, some top slant, which may give enough slant or angle for the bottom of this piece to rest on the top or the back part of this mount, depending on where I'm going to be mounting in here. So we're just going to have to see that how that materializes or how that develops as I'm putting it on. So anyway, there it is on. And like I said, not crazy about having this much sticking out like this. And all they had to do was re-drill those holes. So I'm not sure what they were thinking with these two here. Anyway, now there is one other option here. And that is there are holes in the bottom of this case. We have one here, 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 and here. And they're M6 holes. So we could drill this plate over here to match this pattern to mount it flat on that deck over there. But because I'm just doing a review on this and I won't be using this wheel as my main wheel, then, yeah, I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> and I'm going to go with what probably most people will be doing anyway, using the brackets just for testing purposes also, just to see how all this meshes out. Now, again, I believe this is the 10 newton meter they advertised on their marketing material is peak on this motor. So you're probably running more like eight, seven. So it's not a terrible amount of torque, but, you know, at peak at 10 newton meter, it's still enough for me to not be crazy about the idea of having this whole motor sitting up in the air. It's a pretty heavy motor anyway, and these brackets are going to be supporting all that weight and, of course, the torque. Even though there's a good amount of surface area on these brackets, it's just one of those things that I think about when I'm doing reviews and when I'm actually putting things together and thinking about, well, maybe there's a better way to get this done. But we will see how all this works out once we get this wheelbase mounted. So now we have the wheelbase mounted, and we are using the provided brackets. We are mounted to the P1X's wheel deck. That's what SimLab calls it. 10 millimeter thick piece of aluminum. And it's very sturdy. I mean, it's very stiff. Not quite as stiff as the front mount solution from SimLab, but it does a very good job if you have to use this kind of mounting solution for the wheel base that you're running. Right. So we have the brackets mounted with two six millimeter bolts, like you saw before in the beginning of this segment. And underneath, I have some nylock nuts under there with some washers. This is suspended, as you can see. I'm not crazy about this still, but <laughs> I'm thinking it's going to be okay because this is, remember, this motor is a 10 newton meter peak motor, so I'm pretty sure this is going to be okay. And I do like the, the way how the slot runs all the way down the casing because it's very easy to take the wheelbase and move it back and forth so that you can adjust the reach to your steering wheel very easily, which is very nice. We'll go ahead and go to the other side here. And we have the same thing here. So it feels pretty sturdy as far as the mount goes, the way it's mounted right now, but we won't know for sure until I have this thing turned all the way up and running that wheel on it. It has that's a 330 millimeter diameter wheel, so we're going to get some pretty good leverage on this motor in the shaft on the front of it. So yeah, what we'll do next is go ahead and get in and do some driving. Now for our look inside segment. This is the hub that comes off the front like this, and you can remember this is the hub where we have the holes of the indentations that receive the ball bearings and our quick release back here, and it is hollow in the middle here, and it has a couple of screws that hold this plate on the front. And this plate is what we saw before in the closer look, it sits in there like that. And these gold pieces here are contacts that the pins in the steering wheel, quick release, make contact with for power. And we saw that already in a closer look too. So I decided to go ahead and take this all apart and see just what's going on here. So this is a plate that fits obviously, as we said, right in the front of this. On the back of that is a plug. So we got a little plug back here. And that's for this Molex plug that's coming out of the front of our hub. All right, so that plugs into there. And you can see there's only two wires here on this plug. So that typically means this is for power only. There's no data signal going back from this. So this powers the steering wheel, this guy over here, or the button plate that's on the steering wheel, right? So it's a wireless solution, though. So how does the data get into the wheelbase here 
and then transmit it through the PC. Well, that's pretty cool the way they're doing this. Let me go ahead and put this over here, so it's out of the way. And I'm going to carefully remove the actual hub adapter or shaft adapter, if you will, and pull this off. Now, this is obviously hollow. We have these two set screws here that will connect to the keyway on the motor shaft. So we use these two set screws right here, and we clamp down into the keyway. And then we have another screw that goes in the front that there's a threaded piece in here. As you can see, this M6 bolt goes in there. It's a flathead unit. So it goes in like that, and you can see that the flathead will fit nice and flush with the hub itself. So it's out of the way when we mount this piece to it. Right, let's get that back out. And of course, this wire has to be connecting to something, doesn't it? So we'll flip this around and take a look at it. And there's another piece in here. And this is attached with three Phillips head screws to the back of the hub. Now if I were to take that out, carefully pull it, and I'm pulling the, obviously I'm pulling the wire from the front when I do that. And we'll look on the back here. This is what we see. We have some electronic circuitry down there. All right, I'll give you a closer look at that. And this is the very cool part. This is how it's transferring the power, and we don't have any wires going into our actual enclosure where the motor is. I really like this. So what they're using is what we call inductive coupling to transfer the power from the other side of this into this wirelessly. So it goes through this plate, and then this picks up the power and generates the power that goes through the wires, obviously, into our wheel. So very clever the way they did this. And I'm going to show you the other side of this that I've already taken the plugs off of. Slide that off. And this is a piece of three millimeter carbon, real carbon fiber panel here. So they are using real carbon fiber, which is nice. So we flip this puppy around, and this is what we get. So now you can see we have the other part of that inductive coupling circuit going on here. And there's a Molex wire here. I just kind of tucked it out of the way. Get back out here. Where's my plug? There it is. So we have another Molex plug in here. Same wires, obviously, that plugs into this piece right here. All right. So once that's powering this, then we have the coupling going over and able to transfer the power through this carbon fiber plate and into the plate that's on the back here. Very cool design. I really like this kind of stuff, the way they executed this. We also have some other plugs on here. We got a U or another, not other. We have a USB plug over here. And that's for this piece here. All right. And also what I want to show you here is this little guy here. This is an AS01 ML015 wireless transceiver right there. And what that does is do give you a 2.4 gigahertz wireless signal from this plate to our wheel back here. And we'll see this when we do look inside the wheel, we'll be able to see that a little better, but I'm just going to show you through the grill and there it is right there. You can see it kind of showing itself. So this is the wireless connection that Sim Magic has come up with, which I personally like much better than a Bluetooth solution. The 2.4 gigahertz, I mean, people will argue about this, I'm sure, but this is a, a bit more of a solid connection than some of the Bluetooth stuff out there. And this is based on my own personal observations when using both of these technologies. The thing is also, though, that they put this in the front. They don't put this on the back somewhere like other manufacturers do. They put their, their transceiver back here, and then they'll have one in the wheel somewhere, which is, I, when I first saw that, I was wondering why in the world they would do that when, you know, you've got all this metal casing, you've got a motor inside. Wouldn't it be better to put it up front and then mount it like that so when your wheel is in here and its transceiver is talking to it, look at that nice close proximity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the way I think it should be done. And I'm sure some other companies may even be deciding or even talking about changing their system to where their transceivers are in the front. It just doesn't make any sense to put it in the back to me, antenna or not. <laughs> it's just one of those things. Right, so that's about it on the panel here, and that's really all we need to see. It's, like I said, well done here. I really like the execution of this and what they've done. 
Yeah, it's just one of those things when you pull it apart, you go, yeah, now that's clever. That's the way to do it. So yeah, this is definitely, the guys who built this system know what they're doing. And I'm sure they did a lot of R&D to come up with a solution like this. So yeah, 2.4 gigahertz transceiver facing another transceiver, except when it's turning. But even when it's turning, it's in very close approximation of the other receiver that's sitting here in this plate. So yeah, I really like the way they did this. Now, let's go ahead and look around the back. And I didn't pull this completely apart because really all we have is a stepper motor in here and supporting circuitry for it. But I did want to give you a guys a chance to see what's going on here. Now, also when I pulled this carbon plate off, I thought there was going to be a fan in here. Turns out there is no fan. So that's about the only thing I can say about that. Nice cable gable here that I loosened up and shoved the cable through so I can move everything around without having it hanging in the way. Let's go ahead and put this over here. And again, I want to be careful here. I don't want to mess anything up, do I? <laughs> the first thing, we'll look at the back of the motor here. And on that back of the motor, we can see there is an encoder assembly. And it's an LME 2500 FE, which is a Chinese sourced encoder, which obviously is made in China, so that makes complete sense. And yeah, I didn't pull that off because there's really not much to see on the encoder. It's just going to be a metal round sleeve going around the shaft itself and it will be pick up the movement of the shaft. And of course, that's how we make the wheel move the way we want it to under force feedback. We do have a nice little 25 watt braking resistor here. This gold piece, nice 25 water there. And I was looking down on the board itself and we have two chips here on the board and you're not going to be able to see them. So I'll throw a couple pictures up here. The first one is an ARM 32 or 32F rather 103 RCTG. And that's running a Cortex M3 with a 72 megahertz clock on it. So this is a pretty decent chip right here to do our motor control duties. Because typically that's what this chip is used in this kind of configuration. I'm assuming it's for motor control, but I don't have the exact schematics on this printed circuit board here. So I really don't know for sure. But I'm thinking it is because right next to that, we have a Texas Instruments TMS320. And that's a G4. Now that is a 32-bit CPU in there. So I imagine that's doing the rest of the duties for computations. And we're just gonna use the arm over here for motor control. But then, like I said, I don't have schematic, can't be sure, but that's what it looks like to me. And again, if you can look down inside of here, this is a professionally done unit here. You know, their own proprietary circuit boards are in here. Everything is done very nicely, very neatly. There's no like hard wiring going on in here or it's all just well done. Very professional job here. So I like what I'm seeing inside of this wheel, or rather the wheel base itself. So what else can we talk about? That's about it. Again, it is a stepper motor. It's not a servo motor. So it will have the characteristics of a stepper motor when we use it. But I'll talk more about that when I'm actually doing my driving segments. Let's take a look inside of the GT wheel assembly. First off, we've got everything apart. We've got our wheel off already. And they got the standard countersunk holes in the wheel so that these bolts will fit nice and flush when they're in the wheel. But of course we have an accessory that goes on top of this wheel because the wheel goes on top of the button plate itself like this, of course. And then we have this little beauty cover, I call it, an accent, if you will. It also has countersunk holes in it so that these bolts will fit nice and flatly in them. And these are 35 millimeter long, by the way, M5 with an M3 hex size on the top of the bolt. Now, three of these fit in here, so we had to put three in here first, and then we put the cover on, and then the other three go in. And they're all the same length as far as the bolts go, and they are going to be bolting through everything, including the cover back here, into this quick release. Now, I showed you this quick release in the closer look, when we we're doing closer look on the wheel. It's what I call the NRG type of quick release. Now, there is a wire going through this. Remember, we do have a pass through with the pins in here. And that actually powers the wheel itself or our button plate over here. So you want to be mindful when you take this off because this little plug comes off of the back of our circuit board here. All right. And yeah, you just want to be careful when you take all these things off. One thing about feature about this this has two bolt patterns and it has a 78 and a 70 millimeter PCD bolt pattern like most of them do. Now, another thing 
if you wanted to take your sim magic wheelbase and run like a, a different aftermarket quick release system on it, like a Q1R or the zero play from HRS, you would need an adapter for this because this is actually a 58 millimeter PCD pattern on here that accepts this NRG style ball bearing quick release. Or you could just buy another one of these because the distributors for Sim Magic will have these in stock for you to purchase. So if you want to run a couple of different wheels on the same wheelbase over there, you can just bolt one of these to your wheel and be done with it. So there's different ways to go about it, but it can be done. Now there was one feature about this that I want to show you. It's a safety feature that keeps you from accidentally pulling your wheel off, I guess. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to trip the inside of this and it'll snap up. I'm going to go ahead and do that if I can make the ring pop here. There we go. Almost. There we go. <laughs> Don't want to put my finger in there. It's like a mouse trap. It'll, it'll get you. All right. So this little piece here, right now it's, you see it's not very, it doesn't protrude past the surface. You can take an M1.5 or an M, a 1.5. There's a little set screw in there. See that right there, right where that is. And if I loosen that up, I want to put some pressure on this when I'm doing it. It's a little bit, doesn't take much. It'll pop up. All right. So this means that when I pull this now, when I'm taking my wheel off, it hits that and it hits it to a point that the ball bearings will not release. See how they're still showing? They're still protruding. Right. So I will have to actually take this while I'm doing this and push this down and then it will go in and lock. See, now it's locked like it's supposed to be. But most people don't want to mess with that. But this is a safety feature, and I'm going to go ahead and re-tighten that because I don't want it either. I just wanted to point out that that is a feature of this type of quick release. And so now when it trips, go ahead and do that again. I can do that without. There we go. And now I can just do this. Well, got to get the bearings to fall right. There we go. And yeah, you don't have to push the button. So it's a safety feature that most people don't use, but it is there if you want to mess with it. Right. Enough of the quick release stuff. So the board itself, of course, we have the front of the board here. This is a two millimeter thick carbon plate. And this is a 70 millimeter PCD, obviously, because it fits the steering wheel. Get these out of the way. And you don't have to take any of these knobs or anything off when you pull this off. It's all one integrated unit. And again, very nice, clean looking board that Sim Magic has here. It says Sim Magic Dynamic right there. And you can see we have some Molex plugs in here. And again, this one is for the plug that's inside of our quick release that will power the wheel or power this board. And then we have some Molex plugs up here. We have a set up here, and that's the ones that I pulled the shifters out of. And then we have another set down here, which leads me to believe, like I was thinking when I was doing the closer look and looking at the wheel, that you could probably run another set of paddles here. Uh, analog paddles, I'm not sure if you can, if this will do analog on this board or not, but maybe. But yeah, you can definitely run, they, they have an option here. And not only that, but we're gonna look right here real quick. There's another set of holes here inside this housing, see? We've got two screw holes to mount something like we are mounting this shifter right now and a hole here to run another wire through. So you can see how the extra functionality has been built into it. Back to the board before we really take a look at that, which is a nice assembly, by the way. We have a USB pass through here so we can just run this wheel by itself with a coiled USB cord or a straight one, whatever you want to. It is a mini USB port on there. And of course we have if you've seen the look inside on the wheelbase assembly, you already know about this. This is an AS01ML015 transceiver. This is a transceiver on the board itself. And that's a 2.4 gigahertz frequency receiver. Same thing you have on your routers in your house. And some of them are 5 gig too, 5G. So we, we call it 2.4G. So. That's very, and again, I really like the way they set this up because now we have a transceiver in the wheel, which a lot of wireless wheels now do with some semi cubic solutions and all this other stuff going on out there right now. But those are Bluetooth. This is 2.4 gigahertz wireless, which in my personal opinion, I would rather have than Bluetooth. And yeah, so this is sitting on the wheel and it's actually got some slots in there. If you saw the closer look on the wheel, you saw how you could actually see this board through these slots. 
So there's no metal covering it to degrade the signal penetration, just the slots. And of course, if you watch the closer look in, or the look inside for this wheelbase, you know that right here, where this little light comes on, is another one of these transceivers, right? So we have this one located here, and it's when it sits, when you have it at 12 o'clock position on your steering wheel, they're both looking at each other right straight away. And then even though you were gonna turn it, it's much closer in proximity than let's say a Bluetooth solution where you have this in your wheel, but they have like an antenna, Bluetooth module back here with an antenna, which is again, one of the things that I've always wondered why they did that, why they didn't put something up front here. I'm sure it was aesthetics to begin with because it's just as easy to mount something on a front plate, but then with the different configurations of different wheelbases out there, maybe there was another problem with the engineering part of it, but yeah, whatever. But this, you, as you can imagine, this is a more desirable setup to have two 2.4 gigahertz transceivers looking just about straight at each other. So yeah, you can't get much better than that, I think, as far as for signal reception. You can see the little antenna in here on this. Let me get the light on it there. See on the top part? That's the little antenna wires there. So yeah, I'll give you a real close look at it. I really like what Sim Magic did with this. Very impressive. And with their uh, inductive coupling they're doing to transfer the power wirelessly to the hub, which of course goes into this, which powers it. You know, they've done a good job with this. They got some, they know what they're doing over there apparently. <laughs> All right. Enough with the board and the, the transceiver. Now we'll take a look at the aluminum housing that they have in the back. Again, there's a very nicely machined piece here. And, you know, everything's like it should be. It's rounded corners here. There's no sharp edges on the actual housing itself, even where it, the carbon fiber piece sits in there. It has a nice channel cut out inside of that where the carbon fiber plate will lay. You see how they did that. And, of course, these are tapped holes that will let us screw in screws that hold that carbon fiber plate in there. And you can see they've milled in or left, because this used to be one big piece of metal, they've left in these nice standoffs for very good strength. I mean, look at these things. These babies are solid for mounting your wheel and your quick reset symbol together, your assembly rather, together. And yeah, I really like the way they did this. It just looks good. It's a professional machining job. It's well engineered. It's well designed. They, they came out with something really good here with this, and I like the way this feels and looks. Of course, it's hard for me to convey what it feels like in hand, but it's very substantial. It's very, very stiff. And yes, yeah, so overall performance of the wheel itself when you're driving it, that will translate into something that you're going to like to drive. <laughs> All right, so and we got a couple of wires here, obviously, and again, those are for the shifters on Molex plugs on the back of this panel here that I'll be putting back together when I put the wheel back together. So yeah. That's about it. That's the look inside. And uh, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. So we're in iRacing at Sebring in the Ferrari 488 GT3 for a little bit of a live tuning session just to see what's going on here. Now, I've got this wheel set up because it's a 10 Newton meter wheel. I have it set up at actually at 9.8 Newton meters in the iRacing settings. And I just do that from habit. I've been doing that a long time and I just I got it because just to make sure it doesn't get overdriven from the game input as far as its peak capabilities. But I may not even have to do that now. I don't know. I just keep doing it. But anyway, all the buttons work. The shifter works. The rotaries. Now, remember when we were talking about the rotaries in the software, it was skipping and missing. But once I'm in game here and I map this in iRacing, this is my field of view here. And you can see every click I'm doing, it moves. So it's not missing any, any clicks at all. And of course, all the other buttons are working. If I want to do my force feedback max force setting, I have that set up on the other one, but you can't probably see that very well because it's so small. But it works fine. It's not missing anything. So once in game, all that went away. So I'm not sure why that's happening, but there you have it. <laughs> and all of the other buttons work fine. All right, so we're going to go out under the stock settings. And these are the stock settings you're looking at now in the race manager and that's 100 100 for wheel speed total force wheel dampers 10 everything else is 10 game effects we have game damper on at 100 but i don't believe game effect takes any effect in i racing and then we have a constant force of 100 right and that's game force too so we're going to play around a little with this a little bit and see what happens and right out of the box 
this is what we have. So I'll see what this does. I've got the sound for the car turned way down so you guys can hear me talking instead of the car. And you know, this feels a little bit too heavy on the spring, what I would call spring. No, what I mean by that is it wants to return to center too, too much. It's just too quick to come back to center. Now, I don't know if that's wheel spring, and we're going to try to change that with just the wheel spring setting. And I have been playing with this a little bit, so I don't just stumble around here. <laughs> but yeah, it's, and you can see I can get oscillations in there pretty quick too. But if I take the wheel spring out, you saw how easy that was to do. Let's go back down to one. I'm just going to take the wheel spring totally out. And we'll take that to zero. And of course, you have to save it every time for the settings, settings to take effect. So you make sure you do that. All right, so here we go. So no spring at all. And I do feel a difference when I did that. It doesn't return quite with as much force. In other words, it doesn't try to push against you when you try to turn the wheel and try to return it to the center quite as hard. But you can see it still will oscillate a lot. Now, here's the thing about oscillations too, by the way. I can make any wheel do that, right? If I just know how to do that. And any wheel will do it. Any direct force feedback wheel will oscillate. But I don't mind a little bit of oscillation if it means that I get the detail I want. Because when I'm driving, I don't take my hands off the steering wheel unless I'm going to hit something. <laughs> so other than that, I've at least got one hand on the wheel, which will keep the dampening effect on it so it doesn't do that. So wheel spring, it did make a, a difference, but it didn't make as much difference as I think it should taking it completely out. So what we're going to do next is we're going to go over here to this. I'm going to leave everything at total force because I like the torque I'm getting here. I'm going to take the wheel speed out. And I'm going to take that down to half, around 50 or so, somewhere around 50. Let's get it 49. Okay, 49 is close enough. And I'm going to save that. So now, let's see what we got. So right away, I can feel that there's not as much force trying to center the wheel. In fact, it feels better to me because it was too much before. So it'll still oscillate as you can see, but not quite as, as vicious as it was before unless I really let it go and I, and I keep accelerating. So that actually helped with the oscillation too. So keeping that in mind, now that I've done that, I'm going to go back and put a little bit of spring, wheel spring back in. I'm going to go, in fact, I'm going to put the original tin back in and save it. So let's see what that does. It doesn't, again, it's, it's not returning to center as hard as it was. So I'm thinking that the wheel speed setting is for that, how fast it will return to center. Because now I've got some springiness into it again, which I didn't have once I brought the wheel speed down with the wheel spring completely at zero, which I didn't, you know, I want some wheel spring to come back. And it's still going to oscillate, but that's not surprising because it, I don't have a lot of filter dialed into this wheel. And it's still a little numb to me on the road texture. Not the bumps. Coming off the curb is good. You can feel that very well. And while we're doing that kind of thing, there's an issue of, is there any latency in the wheel? And you should be able to see and feel at the same time what one of your front tires is rolling over. Like when I dropped this off, as soon as I saw that where it should have dropped off where the wheel is located, not where I'm seated, but where the wheel should be located, I should feel that. And same thing over here. As soon as I come off of that, I should be able to feel it based on what I'm seeing. And this wheel does a good job at that. I don't detect any latency or enough to make me draw my attention to it. It just does exactly what I think it should be doing at the time it's supposed to be doing. And that's probably one of the most important things about a wheel right there. Because if it happens after you see it, it's, you're going to have to adapt to a lag, if you will, or latency. And that's not good when you're trying to drive a car at its 
limits. So I'm going to go over the bump here if I can catch it. Yeah, see, as I dropped down off it, I felt it in the wheel right away, which is what you want to do. So I'm kind of liking that with that, that much spring in it. But with the wheel speed turned down, it's like the wheel speed's adding some kind of a, well, wheel speed, I guess, the faster it adds speed to what's going on. Now, I'm not feeling as much detail in the road surface that I want to. I'm feeling it. Like I can feel these rumbles right here. But I'd like to feel them a little sharper. So I'm going to look around. What can I do to make that more of a sharper feel? I've got wheel damper and I've got overall filter. I think I'm going to take the wheel damper and take it off first. And then I'm just going to go ahead and save that. I'm not going to play with these game effect stuff or game force stuff right now. Because I'm just going to concentrate on these other settings. All right. So now we've taken all the dampening out. I'm trying to. It's a little bit, yeah, there's a little bit more detail there now. Let's try these guys. Yeah. So there's a little bit more detail when I took all the damping off. But I got a feeling the overall filter may have a larger impact on the detail I'm feeling on the road surface. As we approach 17 where we got all kinds of road surface action going on. Let's see what I feel going down the straight. Yeah, see, that's, that's kind of vague. So what I'm going to do is, and you can only do this in a test session, by the way, is I'm going to go back and run that section again. It's one of my favorite sections because there's so many bumps coming down this straight to feel what's happening in a, in a steering wheel. Not so much the suspension when I'm doing motion, but this, I like to, because it's a repeatable place that's easy to get to. Because all you got to do is drive back and forth down it. But you want to make sure you get back around the turn so you can get your speed up so that you keep the, you carry the same kind of speed and it doesn't mess up your testing. So I'm going to go ahead, turn this puppy around, make sure no traffic's coming. I'm going to leave the damper off. I'm just going to pull the filter off, the overall filter. I'm just going to take it all off. I mean, if that doesn't do anything, I don't know which direction to go in after that. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get up to speed, come down the straight. And here we go. All right. Back up to speed. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely crisper on the bumps that I'm feeling now. So we'll just keep going around turn one here. It's actually coming, coming together pretty good here for me as far as what I feel, or like to feel. Go ahead and drop it off here. That's good. And it's good enough strength to make me feel what's happening when I drop off, and, and you can feel the torque of the wheel turning and snapping when you drop off one of the sausages or the curbings like that. And we're going to go down here through this other section, too, off this hairpin, see what that feels like. I have another place down here for transitions between the asphalt and the concrete. That's a good test. So I'm going to go ahead and go over that and see what I feel. All right here. Yeah. That felt pretty good. It, it twisted the wheel like it should. And that one did too. It's like it's getting dark out here. <laughs> Let's see, bring. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and good detail on that concrete patch as I felt the bumps from that and it transitioned to a smoothness when I came off of that patch right after the turn. That's another place. There's a lot of little places at Sebring you can do these, do this at and test it. And that's just a curb, so I'm not going to get a rumble off of that. And this one, you don't get much rumble off of this anyway. You get some noise. You get the, in the audio, you can hear it more than you can feel it. But this one has a little bit in it. And then we get some down this one. Yeah, I can feel that one. And this is my drop off where I always drop the tire off and it comes back on. Sometimes I drop off that too because I messed the turn up. But everything feels pretty good here. Yeah, see how as soon as that wheel came off that curbing and hit, I felt that snap in the wheel. And that's the way I like my wheel to feel. At 10 newton meters, I'd like to have a little more force myself personally. But again, all this is totally subjective. And you can see going down the straight, if I don't do anything to the steering wheel, 
it's not oscillating. A little bit, it's twitching, but it's not oscillating at this setting, which usually means that I can go with some more detail. But to be honest, I don't know where else to go because I've got damper turned off. I've got overall filtering turned off. And my wheel spring, I want some of that to be in there. I might take that down to five. We'll do one more thing here. Let's take that down to five and see if that does anything for me. All right. A little less spring. Maybe I get some more detail out of that. Maybe I can take some of the speed out of the wheel, but I, I don't think that's going to matter. In fact, I might dial some more speed back into the wheel. All right, going to ground. Let's turn here. Yeah, that's better right there. That's got my spring, wheel spring, where I want it to be. I think. Again, I think I'm going to do one more thing with the wheel speed and see if that affects anything. Because wheel speed might also give me a little bit more texture or detail off the surface of the road, too. So we're going to do that. I do like where the wheel spring is right now. Right now, I could, I could live with this. Now I'm just kind of pushing it a little bit and seeing what, what else I can get. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go up to 75. We were around 50. Let's go up to 75. Let's go up a quarter of what's available anyway. There we go, 75. And let's save that. Save. Okay. See what that does. And by the way, the, the shifters are very crisp on this. I like them. And I'll probably talk more about that in the driving segments. But they have a good feel to them. Not too hard to pull, not too easy to pull. The reach is good in the GT position here. So I, I do like these shifters. I became very comfortable with them right away. So let's see what that did. You know, that really... Let's see what it does here. Yeah, that was a little bit more concentrated and intense than it was before. So the wheel speed bought that up a little bit. Interesting. Okay. And I don't know for sure. Let's see what we transition here. Yeah, it was a little more detail. It feels like there's a little more detail coming to me with the speed turned up, which kind of makes a little bit of logical sense by what I've been feeling so far based on the adjustments I've been making. I'm actually feeling more bumps there as far as the rumble. You don't get a lot there anyway, but I've definitely felt that. Let's see what we feel here when I always cut this corner. That felt pretty good. Yep, good coming back off of that. Okay, look at, I think it's, yep, good rumble through there. So I'm, I think the wheel speed, I'm glad I, I did that one last tweak there because I think this is probably where I would want it. Now, does it oscillate? Not if you don't do anything. Let me hit the brakes real hard, see if I can get it to oscillate. Nope, nothing there either. All right, so let's go around turn 17 and see how I feel through there. Yep, I like that. Yep, that's pretty good. One more time down the straight. And definitely had the detail where I think it's maximum for this particular wheel as far as what it's able to deliver. Yeah, this is pretty good. Let me drop it off the corner here. Yep. And again, everything seems to be on time as far as when I hit something with the front wheel and come back off, when it settles back on the tarmac. Yep. So the timing is good as far as what I can see and what's happening in my hands. And that's, again, like I said before, probably one of the most important things to be able to get a wheel to do that if it's not doing it already. But yeah, I'm actually kind of liking what I have here now. And this wheel itself, I did want to mention the leather on it. And I might say that again in the driving segment, though. is a bit slick. <laughs> I can't use gloves with this. I mean, I have in some of my testing, but yeah, it doesn't. That felt good. It's too slick for gloves. To... And skin, even my bare hands, if I go wash them, get them good and clean, then it grips it better. But I don't know. I like to see a little bit more something on here. This is very slick leather. It feels good. And you can get a grip. Once your hands get sweaty a little bit, it starts getting a little slick, though, to me. All right, I think that's it, guys. We'll go with this bump. Yep, good timing there. I can cover from slots pretty good, but I knew that. I've been using this wheel for some other reviews, 
because I like to get accustomed to a wheel as I'm using it and, you know, see what it can and can't do. And that was good. Good feeling through there. Yep, good drop off. You saw how sharp that was. I felt it right away in the steering wheel. I would call this my configuration, I think. Now, I might, if, if I was using it, oh, look at that. <laughs> Jeez. I can't stand that curve, man. It's, it's, you know, it gives you like, uh, you gained a second and a half, and all you did was barely clip whatever it was you tripped. All right. In fact, I'm going to go back through this turn here while we're talking. So I like this. I could use this to drive in a race at this setting. I might tweak with the force a little bit, but I'm watching up here in my force meter. I don't want to clip there, and this is a good place to test that around this turn. And I'm getting yellow. I'm getting some yellow, but and just hitting the red every once in a while. See, that's what you want a wheel to do. You want to be able to get, be able to react to it, even though I did take my foot off the accelerator to regain control. But still, it was just as easy to lose control at that point because it was all over the place. But I was able to bring it back, and that's a good characteristic of a wheel in general if you can do that with one. So. I think we'll call that the test. <laughs> and again, you guys can look at these settings, and this is for iRacing, obviously, for a set of course that'd probably be different, R Factor 2 or something like that. But I'm not gonna do all those games and try to test in all those games. I just don't have the time for the video to do that. I'm testing at Sebring and iRacing, and in this instance, I'm in the Lotus 79, doing some heel and toe shifting, and I'm testing out some other stuff. First off, this wheel, if you saw the tuning session, I was able to get a pretty good feeling dialed in. But even with that feeling dialed in the way it was, I was still experiencing some ripple, if you will, torque ripple around when you turn the, the wheel itself. Some wheels are more prone to that than others. And, you know, direct drive force feedback is always a compromise between getting as much detail as you possibly can in the wheel, but at the same time, getting a smooth turning experience in the steering wheel without any notchiness or ripples or call it what you will. But yeah, that's something that we try to get out without losing too much detail. Now, typically the only way to get rid of that is with damping. But damping is a filter and filtering cuts down the details. So it's always, again, like I said, a balancing act for me personally between that. And I was able to get this to where I could handle it very nicely. Everything was exactly how I wanted it to feel. Maybe just a little more detail would have been nice, but if I did that, then the ripple would have come into where it was a, would be objectionable to me personally. And again, you guys have to remember all this stuff is subjective at the end of the day, how much you can tolerate of something, or even if you're sensitive to certain things that come through direct drive wheels. Now, with that said, I was able to get it tuned to where I wanted to, but there was some ripple. But when you're at speed driving hard like this, that ripple, you don't even notice it, it's gone. You're just turning the wheel, you're driving the car, and you're not even thinking about that. The really only time that I notice it is when I'm testing it and I'm going down a straight or something, I'm turning it back and forth, and I'm not going at speed. So this is another thing you have to consider when I make statements like this. It's there, and again, a stepper motor is more prone to this, it seems, from the testing I've done since I've been doing this, than an analog servo motor. Now, I also took the wheel over to some dirt just to feel what the different sensations were there. And this, because there's a constant vibration going in the wheel, you don't feel any ripple at all here. I just didn't feel anything. So I got it down to be that low to where I couldn't even notice it. And even when I got into the straights here on the asphalt or the corners on the asphalt, it was just one of those things that depending on the car you drive, you're gonna notice it more. This car has a, a soft suspension as you might imagine, it's a rally car. We're going over jumps. So it's not gonna be as detailed anyway with that kind of thing. It's like ripples or torque ripple or notchiness as it would in a tarmac type of circuit racing car. So I wanted to feel the differences between the two and it handled the dirt fine. I was able to dial in exactly what I wanted to to control the car like I wanted to. Just no issues there. And I have to remember that this is a 10 newton meter peak wheel. So chances are we're at eight nominal all the time and then getting the peaks at 10 just not quite enough force for me but i'm used to much higher forces when i'm driving but again somebody coming from a belt drive or a gear driven wheel this is going to be plenty of torque and force i think that you would ever want and then maybe later if you think it's not enough after you've developed some arm strength <laughs> you might want to move up to something else i don't know but overall this wheel's just doing a good job it's getting it done and the whole package here 
is a very professionally presented package. The finish is great. I mean, it's just one of those things that just comes together. Everything that I looked at and saw in this had professional level on it, like you would see from Fanatec. And the electronics, the finish, you know, how everything worked. The shifters were snappy and, and had a nice weight to them. So, yeah, again, just an overall really nice wheel set to get into with the wheel and the motor included here. It's one of those wheels systems that just come together quite nicely. And it took them a long time to come to market with this one, and it shows, I think. They really ironed out a lot of the problems. And I like that they have the inductive coupling for the power to the wheel. They have the 2.4 gigahertz wireless transceivers facing each other. They're only like a, you know, a few inches away from each other all the time. So yeah, never had any, any problems with the wireless connection on a working wheel like this. So yeah, that's about all I can tell you on the driving segment. And the latency is very good on this too. I'm gonna show you here a real quick clip as I end this that while I was doing the, if you saw me doing the testing session or the live testing or tuning segment, that yeah, this wheel is quick enough to let you catch some pretty, pretty bad situations in the car. And that's really at the end of the day what it needs to do. Give you the detail and give you the speed that you feel the bumps like you think you should when you're looking at them and to be able to counter steer quickly enough to keep yourself from sliding one way and then snapping as you overcorrect the other way. So anyway, this last segment is a good example of that. And you can see here how that happens when I do a snap back and forth. So the wheel's definitely quick enough to handle that. Final thoughts on the SimMagic M10 wheelbase and GT wheel direct drive force feedback kit. This kit does make a good first impression when you take it out of the box. Everywhere you look, the finish is nicely done. The M10 wheelbase has a peak torque rating of 10 newton meters. While I personally prefer a bit more power out of a direct drive wheel, I think for most, especially those moving up from a gear or belt driven force feedback wheelbase, it will be plenty. SimMagic has implemented some good features here. It has a wireless button plate solution that is the best one I've seen in the SRG to date. With two 2.4 GHz transceivers, one located on the front of the wheelbase case and the other located on the button plate where it is directly facing the wheelbase transceiver, ensuring a strong wireless connection. This is a very common sense solution compared to other DD wheelbase manufacturers mounting wireless solutions on the back of their wheelbases. Another notable feature is how the M10 uses an inductive coupling solution to provide power to the wheel's button plate. With this contactless design, the user should get a long life cycle from this connection. The rest of the wheelbase has a professional, well-executed electronics layout, which continues on to the GT1 wheel and button plate solution. I found this GT1 wheel to be a well-built unit with a nice stiff feel to it. The included quick release system had no detectable play. My wheel has the smooth leather grip. I found this to be a bit slippery when I used my gloves. Less so when driving with bare hands. But still, I would rather have had one with a suede or Alcantara type of grip. But that is subjective based on the individual racer's need, of course. The button plate layout is good enough to suit most drivers, I think and it has some interesting on-wheel tuning options available. The race manager tuning software is easy to use, and I was able to sort out a good setup that suited my personal preferences. I drove this system in a few different cars and scenarios while testing other hardware for reviews. I found it did an overall good job and was able to adapt to these different situations. It has plenty of speed and no noticeable latency, which is a must to be able to keep your car under control when pushing the limits of grip. Overall, I think SimMagic has come up with a professional level direct drive force feedback solution here. Although a stepper motor is not my preferred solution when it comes to driving, this M10 solution is the best overall stepper solution I have tested to date. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.